All right. So once again, this is confidence. When we create an interval and around a particular number that represents a true population and we say we can be 95% certain that the true number is likely within this range is in essence what it's saying. And look at page 126 as in the book to help you think about this in a little bit more descriptive manner. Now what I want to show you here is from a practical perspective. So if you remember page 128 excuse me, in the book, there was, uh, these were restaurants, suburban costs of going to restaurants. This is data on how much it costs to go out to dinner, if I remember correctly. And so here are 50 different data points or costs of going out to restaurants in a suburban area, right? So again, these were a sample of 50 restaurants. What we're trying to do is infer from more generally to a population what is the cost of going out in suburbia to dinner? But we only have 50 data points. So we have one sample essentially with 50 data points. So what we need to do is be able to say, we want to be able to be 95% certain that the cost of going out to dinner in suburbia costs between this and this. So it's a range and we can feel good about that. Um, and again, I will tell you, this is something I love about statistics, is that it's very clear, it's been very clearly defined for us. Um, okay, so what we do here is, again, we're going to run descriptive statistics. We do data analysis, descriptive statistics, okay. And the input range, we'll say A1 to A50. Oops. A50, and then we can do confidence interval for the mean. We want to be 95% sure that we're right. And so we hit OK. And I don't like the way this looks, so I'm going to go to the one that I created for us. OK, so here is that outcome right there. And so again, cool, descriptive statistics. This essentially shows us the mean, the median, the mode, the standard deviation, how skewed or not skewed it is, and I believe this means it's not really that skewed. Um, the range is 46. You've got the minimum and maximum, the number of data points you have, and they're all listed over here, and then your confidence interval. So at the 95 percentile, you can go above or below the mean to create your interval. So 39.96 minus 3.16 is 36.79. That's the lower end of your confidence bracket. 39.96 plus 3.16 is 43. So this means, here's our conclusion. I'm going to put this in a nice blue. Oh, I guess I'm not. So if we collected all samples of 50, and, and we're trying to figure out suburbia, co the cost of going to, to a restaurant in suburbia. And we collected an infinity number of samples, or let's say 1,000 samples of 50 in size. 95% of them would include means between 36 and 43. So it's super cool because we can basically say, I'm 95% sure. And unfortunately, we might get some random outlier. You might get the same data and randomly come up with an average cost of going to dinner of, whoops, let's say 50. So unfortunately, it falls outside of this 36 to 43. And if you look at the distribution, normal distribution, it'd be way over here on the very high end in that like, you know, negative whatever, 0.3%. But it would be unlikely that that would happen to you. You could be, it would only be 5% that would do that. So it's a matter of being confident. I'm 95% sure that that's, that, that I'm right here. Now, if you want it to be even more right, which is one of the questions in the homework about um, whether you need to have a wider confidence variable if you want to be more confident, and the answer is yes. If you want to be more confident, You've got to widen your interval, which I think should make intuitive sense. But what I did here is I took the same data. Here's the same data. And then I filled in descriptive statistics. But, and I'll even show you just to make sure you see it. So data analysis, 
okay? But instead of 95%, I want to be 99% sure that all of my means are captured within my interval. So I need more confidence. So I'm not going to fill it out there just because I don't like the way it pops out. Here is what I did, 99%. So you can see it doesn't state it. Maybe it does. There we go, 99%. So pretty much everything is going to be the same except the 0.422. So you add 39.96 plus 4.22 to get your upper end of the interval. And 3.996, 39.96 minus 4.22 to get the lower end of your interval. So if you notice, let's go back, you were 36 to 43, now you're 35 to 44. So you have had to make it wider to be 99% certain. If we want to be more confident in our results, we have to widen our interval. If we want to be 99% certain, that is state that if all samples of 50 were collected, the 99% would include means of between 35 and 44. Okay, so statisticians have done a really nice job of creating consistency of rules to help us be confident. And to be sure, this confident interval stuff is gonna come up again and again and again. Um, throughout the rest of our time together. And what people usually choose is confidence intervals or levels of confidence of uh, 0.1 or uh, essentially 90%, 95%, and 99%. And the most what are called statistically robust responses are considered to be 95 or 99%. Because essentially you're saying I'm 95 to 99% sure versus at uh, 90%. So you're usually, when you're trying to find a relationship, you're looking for usually to set your bar at 95% or higher in terms of confidence level. Okay, now we're pretty much almost done. What we're, I want to do for a minute is just return to a survey of executive coaching practices article because given all the stuff that we've learned today, you, this will, a lot of it will build on each other. But specifically, even if we look at just means and uh, standard deviations, you can get a lot out of it. Now, by the way, Ashley, let me, I'll show this later. Here is page 10 of 44 in the personnel psych, the survey of executive coaches. What I want to bring your attention to as one example is this piece, oops, in here. Okay, so we've got psychologists and non-psychologists, means and standard deviations for each on how they responded to participants' job roles, which means these are coachy, this is coachy information right here. So it's basically asking who are most frequently your clients? Are they CEOs, are they VPs, are they mid-level people, entrepreneurs, et cetera? So if you go down and you think about the way that Participants' job roles were measured or operationalized because they need to be numerical. What they did, this, they decided that, oh, okay, so if you look at the A subscript there, they measured it as, I never coach these people to I always coach these people. So one question, it might be, how often do you coach CEOs? Either I never have all the way up to I always do. And what they found is, on average for psychologists, up the top here, psychologists, the mean was between I occasionally and sometimes coach CEOs. Now, so if you notice, and then here are the uh, non-psychologists, and the number is actually very similar. They, non-psychologists, occasionally to sometimes coach CEOs. Now, if you look at the highest numbers, the ones that get closest to, quote, always, so the, if you notice, the category most often shows was between four and five. It's not like there's any five numbers in here. So four to, four to five, meaning sometimes to often, which makes probably sense. So the most frequently chosen numbers, I can't highlight both for us, are in here between VP, director level, and mid-level manager. So it suggests that executive coaches most often coach people with the VP and middle level management. And if you want to go to the article to see how that looks in layman's terms, it's right here. Oops, I guess I can't highlight it that way. Most coaching was done at the level of VP, director, and middle managers. And then if you look at these means again, to look for differences, um, if you look, the 
entrepreneurs were coached by psychologists occasionally to sometimes, but really closer to occasionally than sometimes, versus non-psychologists were occasionally to sometimes, but closer to um, sometimes. So it looks like non-psychologists were more apt to coach engineer in entrepreneurs than were psychologists. I think I said that right. Non-psychologists were more likely to coach entrepreneurs than were psychologists. And so you can look and do comparisons here and, um, and make inferences. So let's see. And by the way, we'll get to this stuff fairly soon because these little asterisks suggest that we could be conclusive or fairly conclusive that the means were truly different from each other and not just subject to random um, error that, that the means are probably truly different than each other. So uh, to be sure, I'm going to come back and have you analyze more of the means and standard deviations for your next, your next quiz, so to speak, or your next set of statistical response exercises. Now, also, let me pull back up the, ah, here we go. This is the What Can Coaches Do For You article. Here, let me go back. What can coaches do for you? Remember I said that this article is descriptive in terms of statistics because it essentially reports the data solely for that group of respondents. So as an example, this, the survey asked, okay, so a, there were 140 respondents. We asked coaches what companies should look for in hiring coaches. Here's the qualifications, how they stacked up. So and here's the listing, percentages of respondents who ranked these qualifications as very, very important. 65% of the 140 respondents said it's very uh, important to hire somebody who's got experience coaching in a similar setting. It's very, it's 61% of 140 respondents said it's very important to have a clear methodology in how you approach your coach, coachee. So notice, though, that this is not saying we're inferring that all coaches in the entire world would, would believe this, but rather just that of the people who responded to this survey, this is what percentage of them said this is very important. So it's just describing the data. I, I encourage you to look at this article again. I think it's, it's rather interesting in choosing in terms of thinking about your world here. Okay. Now see how we're doing in time. Okay, so for next session, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, for session seven and eight, I highly recommend at least all of the choice be put to further interpret the existing practice using particular the mean standard deemed information. I'm going to ask them what we now also be to answer this article such a high journal. Hint, see it's contrib at the beginning and at the end of the literature. Best wish and post another old for your first and